create what is called methyl 1 testosterone. If you don't know about this drug, it is actually something that is sold separately on some of. What is up, guys, and welcome back. So, today we are gonna talk about Dibol, Dianabol, or Methanedinone, as it also is known as. But before we start the video, I just want to state that this is only some elaborate thoughts I have on the subject. This is not conclusive, this is not advice or anything. And this is especially because Dibol is almost 100 years old. And this is hence why I don't trust in many of the studies that has been done at that point and in some of the data from that time on. Remember guys, Dibol is from the same time period as when they made DNP. For those of you who don't know what DNP is, DNP is what's used in making dynamite or bombs and in the Second World War, those who were at the bomb factories actually started losing a lot of weight and they actually found out that those people working with the DNP ingested it somehow and it was a great fat burner. Fast forward a couple of years forward, it is now a diet pill and people are just eating it like candy until they found out that it is actually going to cook you up from the inside and it's not very safe and there's a lot of problems occurring if you're using this as just a standard diet supplement. This is why I am a little cautious about what I say about D-Bowl and the data that we extract from here. We can also see it if we look at some of the data I have on some of the books about steroids. We can see that the anabolic and the androgenic ratio varies a lot. This, of course, is because there is a lot of inconcise data on the subject. People can't agree how it works and what's going to happen, yada, yada, yada. And at the end of the day, I don't want to spew a lot of nonsense that's not correct. So what I'm going to do in this video is that I'm going to share the data. I'm going to talk about what I think it means and I'm going to let it be completely up to you to what you want to use this information to. So first off, let's just talk about the pharmacology of Dianabol. Dianabol resembles testosterone to a very big extent and the only difference it actually has is on the 17th alpha group where it has a methyl group instead and on the C1 and C2 position where it has a double bonding instead of the singular. That is the only difference and that is also why Dianabol is going to act a lot like testosterone does in our bodies. Now as we just saw before, we know that Dianabol now actually has at least a lower androgenic ratio than the anabolic one. This could usually mean that it is going to cause a lot less hair loss compared to other steroids where the anabolic ratio is over 100 and apparently it is going to to some degree maybe build more muscle than testosterone. If we are going to look at some of the anecdotal evidence, we know that back in the days in the golden era, Arnold and a lot of other bodybuilders were using d bowl to a great extent and a lot of d bowl were the daily bread and butter of bodybuilding. So we know now that the base steroid in itself is less androgenic than it is anabolic, which is favorable to look on. But what about the metabolites that it is going to create? Mainly I looked at the aromatase and the 5-alpha reductase, mainly because it's the most important for our case. And if we look at the 5-alpha reductase, which is what usually causes DHT to rise, in this case, it is actually going to create what is called methyl 1 testosterone. If you don't know about this drug, it is actually something that is sold separately on some of the drug sites or whatever it is. It is actually a steroid in itself. A lot of guys are using this drug, especially because it's very anabolic and very less androgenic. And this is actually what is caused by combining d with the 5-alpha reductase enzyme. So there isn't very much a point of taking something like finasteride while taking d -bowl because the metabolite that it is going to create is even better than d -bowl itself and it is even less harsh on your hairline if we look at some of the data. Now it is worth mentioning also that d -bowl doesn't have a very high affinity for the 5-alpha reductase enzyme so it isn't very likely to cause the combination and create the method 1 testosterone 
And once again, even though if it does, it doesn't really matter because the substrate isn't a very big problem in our case. So of course, if it creates a very stronger version of DHT but less androgenic, how about the aromatase enzyme? Well, actually, because of the methyl group, it is going to create what's called methyl estradiol instead of estrogen, which is the normal thing we convert testosterone into. Just like the methyl 1 testosterone, it is much stronger than the parent hormone and the original hormone estrogen. And to give a good example, methyl estrogen is what's used in girls' birth control pills, but when they need something with an extra kick, if you can say so. So it's a stronger version of estrogen and Although it has some hair protection capabilities, it is also a problem. And the reason why I see it's a problem is because since it's a stronger version of estrogen, lots of people are taking also too much d at this time, and they are going to create a stronger version of estrogen, meaning they are going to take way more aromatase inhibitors. Now, I'm just gonna show this study quick, and you can read down further below if you want to know more. When you are taking aromatase inhibitors, I think it's about 30% of the cases where people were given aromatase inhibitors, they experienced hair loss. So if three guys are going to take aromatase inhibitors, at least one of them is going to experience hair loss only due to the fact that he is taking aromatase inhibitors. So you see, when you are taking something like d and you can't control the estrogen, when you're taking aromatase inhibitors, you actually might experience hair loss just because you're fighting off the estrogen. Also, as I just mentioned, estrogen is hair protective, so it's not a very good idea to just crash it down below because, once again, that can lead to hair loss. This, once again, leads me back to the dosage. The one problem I see when people are taking d on some of the forums is that they usually start about 40 milligrams a day now, as we just saw in the beginning, it is stronger than testosterone, although less stronger on the androgenic side. But if you're taking 40, let's just say 50 milligrams a day, that's over 350 milligrams on a weekly basis. And if you combine that with testosterone, even though how little androgenic ratio it has, that's a lot of pressure to put on your androgen receptors. And no matter how little androgenic response anything gives, if you take enough of it, it is going to activate the hair follicle where it's going to, going to minitize and then cause hair loss and yeah, you know the whole drill. So that is a major problem I see that people actually underestimate this drug a lot, take way too much and then once again, even though it has weak androgenic responses, if you take enough, it is going to create that action. And 350 milligrams a week, if you take 200 milligrams of testosterone a week on, on the side, well, that's half a gram of steroids weekly. That is going to give most of the guys some problem down the road. So another interesting fact about Dianabol is when we are talking about SHBG, that is sex hormone binding globulin. What this hormone does is that usually it connects with some kind of hormone, usually your male hormones, your sex hormones, that's why it has the name. And some people believe that it's only used to transport hormones from one place to another. Some, mean, some believe that it is used to block the hormone from doing its thing. And by that means it is part of a big regulatory system you have. There's still a lot of discussion going back and forth on that subject, but what we know for sure is that when something is bound to your SHBG, it cannot activate the receptors that it is supposed to activate. Meaning that SHBG is going to bind to your DHT, rendering it completely useless to activate your androgenic response and your hair follicles and hence protecting your hair. But it does the same with testosterone and other male drugs. The interesting part here is usually when you take a steroid that is also going to bind to SHBG and if you don't have enough of that hormone, at least the SHBG, it cannot block let's say DHC and you will have more free DHC in your body. Dianabol is the direct opposite. If you compare it to DHC, the affinity is only 2% for, for the SHBG compared to DHC, meaning that for every 100 let's say hormone molecules binding to SHBG, only two will be Dianabol and 98 of them will be your DHT, meaning that it leaves more DHT to be bound 
and less of the dianabol to be bound and then more dianabol to be free in your system. That is something to be considered if you are considering what drug to take that dianabol actually frees up SHBG compared, compared to other steroids that has a tendency to bind to this hormone. So guys, that is a lot of rambling I just did. I want to sum it up short for you. So the first part is D-Bowl resembles testosterone a lot. Since it resembles testosterone a lot, it is going to aromatase into a stronger version of estrogen. If you fight off that estrogen, you're going to have low estrogen at some point, maybe, which causes hair loss. Also aromatase inhibitors causes hair loss. This is a problem if you get too much estrogen because you take too much D-Bowl. The other thing is it's going to reduce via the 5-alpha reductase enzyme, but into what's called methyl-1 testosterone. That is a way stronger testosterone than the original one and less androgenic, which is good in my opinion. The next part is it is fairly low on the androgenic response and high on the anabolic. So if we look at the data only and it's just going to take a guess, I would guess that it's fairly more easy on your hairline compared to testosterone milligram for milligram. Third part is that it is going to bind to SHBG, but only by 2% of DHC, meaning you have more DHC bound to SHBG, so it cannot do its thing, and less the anabol bound by SHBG, meaning it would be free to activate your muscles. So guys, this is by no means any conclusions. This is just the data I've gathered just to show you. All the studies I've used is down below. You can read up if you want to, or you can just listen to this. Whatever you decide to do, it's your own choice. You should do some research before you do anything. I'm definitely not gonna tell you if it's hair safe or not since it's such an old steroid. But if it were for my own case, I would assume considering the data I just saw, which is new to me personally also, that is, is generally more hair safe than a lot of other stuff you can take. But that is only for me and you to decide. With that said guys, until next time, cheers.